Chapel. Thanks so much for joining us. Welcome to church. We are so glad that you're with us today. And let me just start by saying this, man, we love you. We love you. We've been thinking about you this week and we have been praying for you, praying that God would be with you, with your families and keep you safe. So thank you for allowing us to to just come right into your living room this morning, right into your kitchen, right into your bedroom, wherever you are. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of your Sunday here today. So we are so glad that you're with us. I just want to give you just a few instructions as we jump online this morning. If you are on Facebook Live, I want to encourage you to go over to our church online experience. If you go to wearechapel.org, And if you'll click on the pop-up window, there's a link that will take you straight to our church online experience. At our church online experience, you're going to be able to interact with hosts there. You're going to be able to chat with them. If you have prayer requests, you'll be able to click the live prayer button, and they will take you to a separate window, and you'll be able to have a personal chat and a prayer time and encouragement with hosts right there online. There's also tabs. There's tabs for giving. There's tabs for Pastor Bobby's message that he's going to share in just a few minutes. There's tabs for Chapel Kids. So Pastor Marissa has given you all the resources you need to make sure that you have a great experience for your children today as well. We also have a a tab there for I'm New. If, If you're new to Chapel this morning, man, thank you for joining us. If you would fill out that information, it would mean the world to us today. You know, church is going to look a little different these next few weeks and let's let's just be honest church is going to look a lot different these next few weeks but we know this it is not going to stop us from accomplishing our mission as the capital c church and as chapel church we know this that we are going to continue to pursue god we're going to continue to make disciples and we will continue to make an impact here in our area and in the world Many of you have been doing that. So many of you have been volunteering at the Dream Center. You've been packaging food and distributing food. And that's just one way that we're continuing to accomplish the mission during this season. I want to encourage you and let you know that just because we're not physically together today doesn't mean that we can't connect spiritually. Even though we're not gathering publicly, we're going to continue to meet. We're going to continue to connect, and God's going to continue to do great things in our church. I want to encourage you this morning, too, to to engage with us in this experience. This isn't just another TV show you're watching. This isn't just another thing you're doing on your computer. This today is church. We are chapel, and this is church. So engage with us. In just a few minutes, Pastor Jason and the worship team is going to lead us in a powerful time of worship. Pastor Bobby's going to, to lead us in an a encouraging and powerful message. And, and right there in the online experience, you can see his message notes in that tab. So get your Bible out. Get your notes out. Take notes and, and jump into this message and engage with us today. And also pray with us. We're going to encourage you to pray with us today. Join with us as we pray. And I want to just do that right now. If you would, right where you're at, just go ahead and stand to your feet. Go ahead, stand to your feet right there in your living room, right there in in your kitchen, right there in your bedroom. Stand to your feet and pray with me as we get ready to start this service today. We're going to pray that God would move in a powerful way. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. God, we thank you. We thank you for this opportunity to worship with your people. God, and I just pray right now in Jesus' name that that this experience, God, would, would move through a computer screen, would move through a TV screen, God, and that people in their living rooms, people in their bedrooms, people, God, on their back porch, wherever they are, God, that they would experience your presence, God, that they would experience your love, that they would experience your grace, God, and as we worship together, as we lean into your word together, God, I pray that you would anoint it. God, and you would, you would equip us, God, for this season to be your church. So, God, bless this service today. We love you. We honor you. You have your way today in our lives, in chapel, in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, church. Let's worship this morning. Father, we 
thank you for your presence with us tonight. We thank you that your presence is with us here in this room. I thank you that your presence is in every single living room, every single home that is watching right now, God. Just make us so aware of your presence. Make us so aware of your Holy Spirit in this moment. We fix our eyes on you this morning. There's a grace. There's a grace when the heart is undefined. Another way when the walls are closing in. When I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There was another. Standing next to me, there was another in the waters, holding back the seas. Should I ever need reminded of how I've been set free? There is a cross that bears the burden, where another died for me. There is another in the fire. All my death left for dead beneath the water. I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore. Should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning? Either way, I will bow to the things of this world. Cause I know, and I know I will never be alone. Come on. There is another in the fire standing next to me. There is another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminded what power set me free? There is a grave that holds nobody, but now the power lives in me. There is another in the fire. Oh, there is another in the fire. Oh, there is another in the fire. I can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between west and I can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls cave in. Nothing stands between us. Nothing stands between no other name. There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it. So come what may in the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. I know, I know, yeah. I know I will never be alone. Come on. There'll be another in the fire standing next to me. There'll be another in the waters 
holding back the seas And should I ever need reminding How good you've been to me I'll count the joy of every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be Oh, and I can see the light In the darkness As the darkness bows to him I can hear the roar In the heavens As the space between west and I can feel the ground Shake beneath us As the prison walls cave in and nothing stands between us Nothing stands between There'll be another in the fire Standing next to me There'll be another in the waters Holding back the seas And should I ever need reminding How good you've been to me I'll count the joy of every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be Joy come every battle, so that's where you'll be. I'll count the joy come every battle, cause I know that's where you'll be. I'll count the joy come every battle, cause I know that's where you'll be. It's where you'll be, Lord. Where you be, it's where you've always been, Lord. Oh. Even if he doesn't, I will praise him. declare that this morning. Even if he doesn't, I will praise him. Even if he doesn't, I'll stand strong. Even if he doesn't, I will praise him. Even if he doesn't, oh, I can see the light. Darkness, as the darkness bows to him, I can hear the roar in the heavens. As the space between west and I can feel the ground shake beneath us. As the prison walls cave in, nothing stands between us. Nothing stands between. There'll be another in the fire. Standing next to me, there'll be another in the waters, holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding how good you've been to me, count the joy come every battle, cause I know that's where you'll be. I'll count the joy come every battle. I know that's where you'll be. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we bless your name today. God, we know that you're a way maker. In all things, you're a way maker. Stand on your word because we know that you'll bring us through.
in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, that's who you are. Even when I can't see it, you're working 
your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor He is still for you. He has his hand upon his people and he's protecting his people and taking them from one place to the next, from glory to glory. And this morning as I was praying, I felt like God gave me a word for some people, maybe in this room or even uh, online or on video, uh, that some of you, you're so focused on not becoming like your mom or your father that you're actually slowly becoming like them. You're so focused on the past, you're empowering the past more than the future that God wants to take you to. And you're allowing that, that unforgiveness to turn into bitterness, that, that bitterness to turn into pride, and that pride to turn into a hard heart. And God is asking you, like right now, to love, forgive, and honor your parents so that way you can have access to your heart again, access to your destiny again, so he can take you from point A to point B and from glory to glory, but it's contingent upon you. Asking God to forgive you and move into that forgiveness for those around you. And so we're going to move into a, just an attitude of prayer. So what I'm going to do, we're going to pray right here, but I want you to pray wherever you're at, whatever living room or house, wherever you're at, I want you to pray for one another. I want you to just lay hands on one another in your house. I want you to just ask a blessing. Just ask this song over your family. If you're the head of the house, you're the man, I want you to pray over your family. Just pray this blessing over your family. If you're single mom, I want you to pray this over your family. We're just going to pray. Father, we thank you that you are for us, that we don't ever have to worry about anybody being against us because if you are for us, then who shall be against us? That, Father, we know your hand is upon your church, that your hand protects your people. And, Father, we know your presence dwells amongst your people, not buildings. And so right now, Father, we ask for an increase in the manifestation and the awareness of your presence, an increase in power, an increase in communion, an increase in intimacy. And so, Father, right now, as you, as you commune with us, as you dwell with us, we just intercede on behalf of those that are outside these walls, outside of our homes, outside of our church. And Father, we pray that you place your hand upon all the healthcare workers right now that are serving and loving and treating and being the hands and feet of a healing God upon our earth and upon our nation and upon our communities. 
Father, we pray your hand upon families right now that are suffering financially. Father, we pray during this season they discover that you are Jehovah Jireh, that you have something hiding in the bush to bring replenishment to their finances. Father, we pray right now for business owners and leaders who are suffering through decision making and difficult decisions. We pray, Father, that they discover your wisdom, your discernment, your strength, and your leadership abilities during this time. Father, we pray for just a move of your spirit in and through your people, that, Father, this is not a time for the church to survive, but a time to thrive and be the light in the darkness, to be the hope in the middle of the storm. And so we pray blessings upon your people, but we pray for favor and peace, not just for us, but for our children and for generation to generation to generation. And, Father, we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you, if you were standing, you can take a seat. Um, you know, it's a little different. Our mission stays the same, but it looks a little bit different um, meeting in, in this kind of environment uh, like this. And I, I do believe it's an exciting time that God is doing a lot of things in and around us um, as long as we partner with Him and we participate with Him. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Exodus uh, chapter 17, and we're going to be sitting in there for a little bit as we start this new series um, called Every Home and Altar, and I believe it's a, a, a very pivotal series that God has wanted to use um, to make a difference in our lives. When we first moved to, to Florence, Alabama, we were looking at homes, and I will tell you that you should not look to buy a home as a married couple until you have at least five years under your belt, because you'll probably end up divorced if you start trying to buy a house the first year. Like it is marriage counseling, they don't teach you how to pick a home in marriage counseling. And we were looking for homes, we were looking at Muscle Shoals and Florence, You know, people are saying, you can't live on the other side of the river. People will think differently about you. And so we decided not to, but there's a house we were looking at, Toya Loved. And so when you're looking at a home, many times you're not looking at structural things or the roof. You're looking at paint colors, trim, floor plan, you know, where are my kids' rooms going to be? Where's the master suite? What's the yard look like? What's the amenities? And so we're looking at this house, and Toya said it's the perfect floor plan. Like everything was laid out. It's exactly what she wanted. And so we start walking around the yard. As we walked around the yard, literally the back half of the house, the corner of the house, was cracking and falling down. And I asked the realtor, I was like, like what's up with the corner of the house? And she's like, oh, that's nothing. And I was like, like, literally the house is falling apart. Like, what's wrong with it? She said, well, I think, like, when they were building it, that's where they were burning stuff, and they built on top of that, so there's, like, caving in. I was like, no, nobody builds a house on top of where they dug a hole and burnt trash at. And as we're looking, many times... You don't pay attention to the foundation of a home until the weaknesses are exposed of the foundation. Like we're so caught up in the, the paint colors and the trim and, and the, the facade and the beauty of a home that we don't pay attention to the foundations or the structure of it, even though the foundation is much more important than the paint colors. You can change the paint colors. It's difficult to tear a house down and, and rebuild the foundations. And I, and I believe that many times God will give us opportunities to see our foundations exposed so we can rebuild on top of solid foundations. And I think that's what Jesus is really talking to, about in Matthew chapter 7. He says there's two men. One builds his house on the rock. He's the wise man. He obeys the commandments of God. He listens and does the word. The other man is a foolish man who builds on the sand. And he says as the storms come, the man that built his house on the sand, it gets washed away. But the one who's built his house on the rock, it stands firm. And I believe this season is a season where God is literally allowing the winds of change and the waters of rain to flood our lives, to flood our churches, to flood our families, and wash away all the facades. So all we see left is the foundations. And he's exposing these foundations to us literally as a church. He's stripping away all these layers that we have of production, of fancy buildings, of programs, all these things to get down to this root, root cause or these ancient strategies that we talked about last week, these ancient strategies God wants to use to bring spiritual awakening or renewal or revival to a modern day culture. So he's wiping all this stuff away to get back to the roots. And I believe like, this is like a very prophetic season for the church because everything else is wiped away. Like everything else is gone, and I believe as, as we wipe away all these distractions, God's voice is getting just super clear to his people, to his church, to the world, and people are starting to pay attention to the voice of God. Because literally the only thing we have left right now is God's word, God's spirit, and his people. That's the only thing we have left, and I think God is saying this is perfect for me to speak to my church and use these ancient strategies again that the church was built upon that he wants to bring renewal with. And so Exodus chapter 17, uh, verse 15 is this story where 
Uh, some of you know the story. Moses was the leader of the Hebrews, the Israelites, uh, and, they're, and they're fighting through kind of the, the wilderness. And the Amalekites had come against the Israelites. And as they're fighting against them, Moses stands on the mountainside. And Aaron and her both hold up his hands. And as long as his hands are lifted up to God, there's victory. But when his hands got tired and his hands fell down, all of a sudden there was weaknesses and they started losing and becoming defeated in the battle. And so Aaron Hurd would lift up his arms so they'd have success. And along with the lift up, all of a sudden they started seeing this victory come. And as they had victory, Moses in this verse, this is what he says, that Moses built an altar and called the name of it, the Lord is my banner. So he dedicated this altar to their victory, that it wasn't them that won, it was God winning through their worship and through their praise or through their focus on God and his ability, not their ability. And I believe right now we're at a season where we've tried everything we can to succeed. We've tried economic things, we've tried medical things, we've tried education, we've tried political things, and we're failing at this war we're at right now against this pandemic. And I think God is saying, listen, just lift your hands up. Like, that's where the victory is going to come from. Just lift your hands up. And he says, as he did, Moses built an altar saying, this is where God did it. And he said, the Lord is my banner. And, and banner for us, many times we think of, uh, you go into your high school gymnasium, if you had a good high school, you had banners on the, on the wall or the ceiling that said state champions or state playoffs. If you go to many UNA, you'll see banners of, of conference championships and national titles. We think of these banners as trophies or cloth banners or signs signifying celebration or honor to the past. But this banner wasn't like a cloth banner we would hold up. It's literally a spear that sometimes have different colors on it or cloth attached to it. And it was like a spear. Whoever's in charge would lead out front with this spear and hold it up high so everyone knew which way to go during the battle. They know which way to, to follow during the battle. And he's saying, Lord, the Lord is my banner. He's that leader out front that as long as I'm following him, He's going to succeed. He's going to be victorious. He's going to win this battle. So if I'm following him, I'm guaranteed success. And so that's what Moses said. This is my altar, and my altar is the fact that God is the one who leads me. God is the one who brings victory. And that altar is where Moses decided to set up a celebration of honoring God. And I believe altars are extremely vital to us right now. I believe they're an ancient strategy God wants to bring back into the church. And so altars, this is the, the biblical definition Altars are structures used in worship as a place for presenting offerings or devotion to God. Altars are often related to the concept of tables, hearths, thrones, and even burial mounds. Saying they're, they're places of special worship and places of which there's devotion to God. Places where there's commitment to God or loyalty to God that we celebrate that and acknowledge that loyalty. In my own personal definition is altars are elevated places of worship, meaning it's a special place of worship and prayer where we remember God's faithfulness. We remember the battles he's taken us through. We remember the success he's brought us. We remember his faithfulness. We remember his healing. We remember his deliverance. And then we respond to God's presence and word. So that's what altars are. That's a place to remember how good God has been. A place to, to celebrate God's faithfulness and respond to his presence and respond in worship to him. And this is the key. My altar is anywhere I choose to genuinely seek after and devote myself to God. It's anywhere. It's not, it's not on a battlefield. It's not at the church. It's anywhere I decide this is a place I'm going to earnestly seek after God and desire Him and show Him, God, I remember who you are. I remember what you've done, and I want to see you do it again. And so I believe the word that God is actually, one of the words that God is sharing with these ancient strategies is every home is becoming an altar. Every home is becoming an altar. Why is that? Right now, we can't meet in, inside the sanctuary. We can't meet in, in fancy buildings anymore. Actually, right now, every person in the world, almost every single church right now is meeting in homes. They're not meeting in fancy buildings that we did building vision campaigns for. We're not meeting with all this production elements inside a church. We're meeting inside living rooms, dorm rooms, hospital rooms, bedrooms, kitchens. We're li in living, even people who are working aren't working at, at their work anymore. They're not working in high-rise buildings with offices. They're working at home. And I, and I believe it's something God is saying. He's trying to rebuild the homes. He's trying to go back to this foundational unit that even every mom right now is a stay-at-home mom. God help you. <laughs> every mom is a homeschool mom all of a sudden. <laughs> like Prozac is getting prescribed all over the place all of a sudden. Like 
I, and I think it's, it's, it's prophetic that God is saying there's something that's important about the home that we've been missing and that God is giving us a spiritual reset. He, he's wiping away all the facade to get back to the foundation and saying the home, this is the home and this needs to be strengthened, this needs to become an altar because the ancient strategy of God was always that the home was an altar. Always. And, and I think in modern times we've made the, the church service the altar. We, we've, we've overemphasized the gathering, the corporate gathering, which is great. The, the corporate gathering exists for, for encouragement, for power, for the glory of God to fall down, for us to equip one another to go out and do the mission. But the home has always been the base unit of the altar. It's always been the base unit of discipleship. And I think we've made the corporate gathering so common, we've lost both the glory and we've lost the home. And I think God is setting this reset now where it's not just for this season, but through this season, we're going to learn things that God wants us to keep in play in our lives for the long-term mission of his church. And so even in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6, 4, 9 says this. This is called the Shema, which is Hebrews teach this, and they say this every single day. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. He doesn't say that the kids' pastor should teach them to your children. He doesn't say the pastor or the preacher should teach them to your children. You should teach them to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house. And when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. He's talking about the home being the altar. Meaning the home being identified as the place of the word of God, being the place of discipleship. And that's in the Old Testament. And even he's really nailing it down that this is the place. This is the first priority for the family, to one, to know who God is, he is one, and we're supposed to love him with all of our heart, soul, stro- strength, and mind. And that word love means loyalty, it means devotion, it means dedication. It doesn't mean emotions, it means that you're loyal to God and his purposes. Then, as you are infatuated with God, then you translate that into your children and your house. And then in the New Testament, it's the exact same scenario in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers, and all came upon every single soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need, and day by day attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Like the temple and the home are these two main ancient strategies that God was using. The, the temple was special. Like when, they, when the Jews would go to the temple, it would take weeks to get to the temple. They would journey for weeks after weeks, building this expectation to experience the glory of God. But the home was the place where they spent time with God as a family unit every single day day the old testament the new testament sharing these things and god was bringing awe and wonder upon them as the home was becoming an altar and and i personally i believe in the tangible physical experience of the holy spirit and and i and i believe right now in their season that god is wanting every single home to experience that not in a corporate gathering but in a home god wants you to experience his presence in your living room like you expect to experience his presence at a church I believe in the spoken word. I believe declaring God's word. I believe praying for one another. I believe in laying on hands on one another. I believe in the gifts of the spirit. And I believe right now God is wanting all of those things to happen inside of homes. And I believe truly these strategies, if we partner with God in them, they're going to bring renewal. And I think I'm going to unpack this the next couple of weeks, but I believe the home becoming an altar is one. I believe Sabbath is another. I believe this is like a forced Sabbath. God is saying, listen, y'all are moving way too fast. And y'all are getting way too concerned with your schedules. And I'm going to put a Sabbath on you to make you rest and rediscover my rest again. I believe he's wanting to bring back the the priesthood of the believer, where husbands and wives can be the priest of their household. They're not depending on pastors and preachers and churches and and, and volunteers. They start operating as the priest of the home. I believe there's lots of things God wants to do during this time that I promise you are going to be beneficial to you and your family. And so every home 
in both of these scriptures was devoted to God's word. And so if you want to make your, your home an altar, you have to learn to devote your house to the word of God. Not, not to the preacher's sermon, but to the word of God. Both in, in Deuteronomy, they're literally tying it around their foreheads. They're putting it on the doorposts and the gates of their house. In our house, we have scriptures all throughout our living room on the wall with 1 Corinthians 10, 31, that whatever you do, do it all unto God's glory. Isaiah 6, 8, which says, who shall, my, who shall I send? Who is he looking for? And it says, send me, I'll go. Like, like, we want our kids, we want our family, we want our place to be a place of the word. And literally, if you think about Deuteronomy, he's saying when people walk past your house, they identify your house as being a house of the word of God. Because it was on the outside written down. And so the question would be, is your house identified by the word of God? Or is it identified by the Alabama roll tie flag in the front of your house? Or the Auburn flag? Or whatever you decorate your house with, what is your house identified by? What are you doing during this quarantine? Like, what are you doing in this quarantine to take advantage of it? Like, Pastor Anthony at prayer just the other night talked about Isaac Newton was under quarantine when he discovered literally the law of gravity, under quarantine. Martin Luther, he's basically under quarantine awaiting trial. When he was locked up quarantine, he translated the Bible from Latin to German. That tells me God wants to use these seasons that look like evil for good. And during this quarantine, he's wanting you to partner with him to make your house a home, to take advantage of it by making it a place for the word. Because the things of God are not taught, they are called. And I think that's why in Deuteronomy, even in Acts chapter 2, he's saying you need to model this to your kids. You need to model this for your neighbors. You need to model this for yourselves because these things, kingdom principles, cannot be taught. They're caught by seeing them lived out in example. And our kids are seeing a model before them. Our neighbors are seeing a model before them. And the question is, what are we modeling? Like this principle, the home is such a strong principle that it works whether you pay attention to it or not. Like regardless if you're trying to do it, it's already working. So the question is, what are you modeling to your family? Are you modeling kingdom values? Or are you modeling a different kingdom's values? Are you modeling the word of God? Or are you modeling your opinion? Are you modeling the word of God and devotion to who he is? Or are you modeling your passions, your pursuits of worldly things? What are you modeling? Because as parents, our time is limited. Like Alicia is about to be 17 years old. The twins are about to be 15 years old this week. And time is limited. And it used to be easy to model these things when they were small because they liked us. Half <laughs> they're older, they don't like listen to us very much. And when they were younger, we kind of controlled the schedule. Now that they're older, we're more like Ubers for our kids than parents. Taking them here and taking them there, all these things. And so it's become more difficult to model those things. And our kids and our families will flourish when they're hearing God's word, they're obeying God's word, they're submitted to God's word, and they're falling in love with God's word. And it's our job as families to make our homes an altar of his word, of devotion to his word. And she said, well, I don't know how to do that. Well, this scripture says, as you go. How many of you drive your kids places? They are trapped, and they have to hear what you have to say. Like, they are trapped. Turn on a sermon. Turn on version. version has an audible feature. The Bible in a Year app has an audible feature. They're trapped. As you're driving them to sports, ask them, what God is doing in their life. Ask them what God is speaking to them. Tell them the word of God. Start speaking the word of God over them. As you're sitting in your house, do you have a couch at your house? If you have a couch and somebody sits there, share the word of God with them. If you're eating dinner, share the, make your house. You have this in you to make it happen. So make your home an altar by devoting your house to God's word. And then two, make your home an altar by filling it with God's presence. Like, fill it. In Acts chapter 2, these homes were filled with the presence of God. It said the awe and wonder of God was filling them. Like, miracles and signs and wonders were being done, not in the temple, but in the home. And you can fill your house with home because the Spirit of God is dwelling not in temples made by man. He's not dwelling at, at Christ's chapel. He's not dwelling at the churches in town. He's dwelling in you. And I think one of the things really God wants to hit hard right now what he really wants to drive home is that he wants us to steward the presence of God, not just in corporate gatherings, but in our living rooms, our kitchens, our bedrooms, our dorm rooms, our, our vehicles, our cars, that we have poorly stewarded the presence of God. Poorly stewarded the presence of God. 
And he's wanting you and I to begin to steward God's presence. That when, when the Spirit of God is in our homes, that when people come in, they walk into the presence of the Lord. Even just a couple weeks ago at, at chapel, there was a, a missionary from the Philippines that, that had come to church. And afterwards, he's talking to, to Melissa, and, and Melissa brought me up, and he was just saying, hey, listen. He's like, as soon as I walked on the property, I experienced the presence of the Lord. And he said, you know, I've been to other churches where you come in, and, and there's a lot of production, but I didn't experience the presence of the Lord. And my, my wife is Filipino. She's never really been to an American church and experienced the presence of the Lord. He's like, as soon as we walked in, he's like, she started weeping, and she said, now I get it. And she was weeping as she was talking to us. And, and so during this season, my thought is, what if people said that instead of walking into a church service, said that when they walked into your house? Like, like what if they said it when they walked in your house, they said, I, I don't know what it is, but like, I feel the presence of the Lord here. Or I don't know what it is about this house, but something is, is different. What if we stewarded the presence of the Lord where we were always with him, not just when we're in a corporate concert worship gathering service? What if it was that? Because everything has a soundscape. I've been kind of studying the soundscape kind of theory that even Disney World knows there's a soundscape. That when you walk through different parts of Disney World where you want it to be, you know, the, the nature or the wild, they can't get that sound because there's planes flying over and, and people talking. So they actually pipe in white noise to neutralize all the exterior noises. And they said sound is the quickest reaction we have of all of our, our senses. Quicker than touch, quicker than sight, quicker than taste. That you'll respond to something when you hear it before you ever see it. That's why movies spend millions of dollars trying to make sound, uh, soundscapes and, and sound, what soundtracks and all this stuff with that. And meaning there's a sound that causes the reaction. Every place, every restaurant has a soundscape. Your house has a soundscape. And so what if, what if the, all the noise in your house was drowning out the presence of the Lord? What if all the iPads, what if all the Netflix, what if all the Hulu, what if all the ball games, what if all the, the, the music we have on the TV, what if all that white noise has been distracting us from the presence of the Lord? And God all of a sudden says, listen, I'll just, I'll just cut it all off. Like Netflix crashed this week, sports is, is done. What if he's removing all the white noise to bring us back to the presence of the Lord? What if the missing piece in your family literally was the presence of the Lord? What if it wasn't church attendance? What if it was the presence of the Lord in your house is what is missing from your family? Bernie Cross, who is a big National Geographic guy who recorded audible sounds of nature, he said in the 1960s it would take him 15 hours to get one undisturbed hour of, of audio footage, meaning he would record 15 hours to get one hour that was undisturbed by airplanes or cars or et cetera. He said now it takes 2,000 hours to obtain that one hour. That's how quickly we are flooding our lives with noise that drowns out the presence of the Lord. Like, what if God is using us as the time to really rediscover the presence of God in our homes? And what if the presence of the Lord doesn't sound like, like a worship concert or worship music? What if it sounds like the pitter-patter of little kids' feet in your hallway? Like, what if it sounded like the, the laughter of, of teenagers in the kitchen? What if it sounded like kids fighting over a board game in your living room? What if it sounded like worship music on instead of the TV on? What if it sounded like peace and calm? What if it sounded like conversation with neighbors? What if it sounded like family dinner? What if the presence of God sounds like completely different than what we expected to sound like? What if he is dwelling in those, those quiet, everyday moments of our households, but we're just not paying attention? And God is saying, listen, this is an opportunity to turn it all off and really rediscover my presence in your house. Like you can turn off the TV, like you can turn on worship music, you can, you can cut off all the other noise in your house, you can sit at the table together, you can sit in the living room together and rediscover the presence. Flood your house with the presence of the Lord. You can lay your hands on your kids and pray. You can, you can worship God in your house just like you would on Sunday morning. And three, the third thing that you see in these scriptures is they were making their homes an altar by creating these moments to share love with one another. So they were devoting themselves to the word of God. They were filling their homes with the presence of God, but they also created these moments to share love with one another. In both scriptures, they're sharing their hearts, they're sharing their moments, they're sharing their time, they're sharing their love with one another so they could experience life. Like life, sometimes life goes so fast we lose it. Like sometimes you get so busy trying to build a life you don't actually live a life. 
And what if maybe this moment is time to slow down, to rediscover that there is an altar in your house that you haven't even been worshiping at? Like one of the definitions of, of altar is it says hearth, burial mounds, but it also said tables. What if the family dining table is actually an altar God designed? What if the communion, the Lord's Supper, there's more to it than just a little bitty shot glass of grape juice and a little nasty piece of dry cracker? What if it's actually the experience around the table that's just as important as the sacrament? Like, what if it's eating dinner? Even this past week, RJ was out of school and they went fishing, him and his buddies, they came back with like 15, 20 bluegill. He's like, Dad, we're going to fillet these fish. We're going to eat these fish. And he's like, he's in straight redneck mode right now. And so he's, he's out back. They got a flashlight flaying these fish. And at 930 at night, they're frying fish in our house. And Toy's like, should I help him? I'm like, he's 13 years old. Like, he has to learn to do some things. And so they're cooking fish. I don't even know if the fish was done. It may have been sushi for by the time they were done. But him and his buddies were eating. And I thought to myself, like that laughter, that experience, that moment, they're sharing life together. And what if that's what an altar really is? What if it's this moment of sharing time together? Because love is an environment where all of God's people grow and flourish. And if you don't take the time to express love or share love, it's not really love. Like, if you don't communicate it, it's not really love. If you don't share it, it's not really love. Like, love without sharing isn't love. And, and maybe the table is this altar God has given us to really slow down and share and express our love for one another way while we have the chance. And you have the opportunity to start making your table an altar again. You can't go out to eat. I think that's a sign that God is showing us that maybe the table is important. I mean, you can't really do much. Maybe you can sit at the table. And maybe the only thing you could buy at Walmart was ramen noodles. Make some ramen noodles together as a family. Sit down, put some cheese on those jokers and some soy sauce. Spruce them up however you can spruce them up and sit there and say, God, thank you. Like, God, thank you for this opportunity that you've given me my family that I get to share this moment with. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for your presence. And just like we said, it's a chance to remember God's faithfulness. To look back and remember God's been faithful to our family for generation and generation and generation. God's been faithful to our family through healing and deliverance and salvation. God has been faithful. He's been so good to us and he's not going to stop being good. What is God doing in your life right now? And use the table as this conversation piece to build an altar under the Lord. And as you do, I promise you'll start seeing God unite your family. And where there's unity, there's a commanded blessing according to Psalms 128. There's a commanded blessing upon it. Because as Moses said, I'm going to build this altar and he's going to name it. The Lord is my banner. He's also saying this, this principle that your altar and your victory are tied together. Your altar and your victory are tied together. If your house is not victorious, maybe it's because the altar is not established. If the church is not victorious, maybe it's because the altar is not established. If the Lord is my banner, if he is my victory, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my victory. If he is my victory and I'm not living victoriously, maybe I'm following the wrong banner. Like literally, maybe I'm following the wrong signal. Maybe I'm following the wrong general, the wrong, wrong commander. Maybe I'm following, because my God is always victorious. He leads from triumphant victory. And maybe, just maybe, the altar and the banner are the same thing. And so if you're needing victory in your life, in whatever battle you're facing, like we're all in this one, I think it's really cool for the first time that I know of, in the world, we're all facing the same battle, and we're all on the same side. It's not like World War I or World War II, where everybody's going through it, but there's different sides. Right now, everybody in the world is facing the same invisible enemy, and we're all on the same side. And what if God is saying, now is the time to build an altar and show that the church, if you follow Jesus, if you build your rock, if you build your foundation, if you build your home on his foundation, there's victory to victory to victory, glory to glory to glory. And so whatever battle you're facing, if you're not victorious, I promise you, check who you're following. Check your foundations. If your house is unsettled right now, check your foundations. Start inspecting the foundation. Don't inspect the paint. Don't inspect the trim. Don't inspect the, the, the appliances. Don't inspect the electronics. Inspect the foundations and see what it's built upon. 
Because if it's shaky, I promise you, it's not built on Jesus. If it's shaking, I promise you, it's not built upon Jehovah Nisi, the banner. And so my prayer for you is right now that you find victory. Not, not even in the pandemic, you find victory that, that supersedes this season, how, however long it's going to last. And this will be a season. But when this season's over, there's a greater season of victory for you and for the church. There's a greater season of, of triumph for you and your family that goes as they sing from generation to generation to generation for a thousand generations. Why? Because in 2020, our family had an experience where God was doing something supernatural. Instead of fighting against it, we embraced it. And we made our home an altar so that way when my kids grew up, their home became an altar. And their grand, my grandkids, their home becomes an altar. And we started embracing what God was doing and following Jehovah Nisi into victory. And so I want to pray for you this morning. If you would, everyone just bow your heads and close your eyes. And if you're home, you can bow your heads and close your eyes or, or whatever. I just want to pray for two things. One, that if you're not experiencing the victory that you think you should be experiencing. Maybe it's because you have not built your life upon the rock of Jesus Christ. You built your, your life on the rock of a church, the rock of money or finance, the rock of your family, the rock of your job, your career, and maybe the shaking has exposed some flaws in your foundation. You say, you know what? Today's the day that regardless of what happens during this season, I want to build my life on Jehovah Nisi. I want to build my life on the rock of Jesus Christ. And so I'm going, to, I'm going to pray for you. And if that's you, if you see, you know what, God is working on you in your heart, there's people to pray for you. If you're on an online campus, you can reach out. They'll reach out to you and pray with you and, and make that happen. If not, call the church office. We want to walk with you on your journey. We don't want this to be a decision. We want it to be a lifestyle. Secondly, I want to pray for every single person that's in the battle right now, that you can lift your eyes up above the chaos, above the turmoil, and you'll see that banner out in front. You'll see that spear that has these cloth hanging out, and you'll realize you may not be able to see God amongst all the crowd and all the chaos and the dirt and the dust, but you'll see that banner, and you'll know that Jesus is holding that banner. And as long as you can see that banner, as long as you can see that signal, you can keep walking and marching in the right direction. And you know, as long as you march, you'll have victory. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this supernatural moment in history we get to be a part of. And Father, I pray right now for not temporary eyes. I pray for spiritual, eternal eyes. We can see the beginning from the end. We can see how you're going to bring us through this. And we can see from generation to generation the fruit this season is going to bring. So Father, for the people right now that you're working on their heart, bringing them through this to a place of salvation. I pray, Holy Spirit, you renew their hearts, you regenerate their hearts, and you cleanse their hearts with the blood of Jesus Christ. That you allow for this not to be a decision, not to be an emotion, but to be a commitment of loyalty to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. A commitment to be loyal to the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of man. And Father, as you do, I pray that you renew their minds, you renew their strength, and you fill them with your sweet, sweet Holy Spirit. Father, for everyone that's watching right now, everyone in this room, I just pray that you empower them with your spirit. That there's revival that begins to flood the homes of your people. That your homes become places devoted and dedicated to your word, your sacred word. That when people walk by, they see your word being modeled by the homes and by the families. Father, your homes become dwelling places, temples, that the glory of God not just fills, but overflows and floods out of your homes and out of your families into their neighborhoods where all and wonder and miracles and wonders and signs and healings begin to flood neighborhoods through your homes. And Father, that you allow for your homes to be places to share love once again, to make the table an altar of experiencing love and relationship with one another. So Father, we just pray for strength to rise up, power to rise up, faith to rise up, and for encouragement to rise up to move through this storm into the promised land. And so Father, we bless you, we love you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. Wow, what a, what a powerful message today. And don't you just love our pastor? Pastor, thank you for that word. We, we needed that word. We needed every word of that today. So thank you 
so much. It's, it's time to make every home an altar, church. And I, I don't know about you, but I, I'm ready to gather around the table with some ramen noodles and some cheese and have a dinner and talk about Jesus. Uh, let's take advantage of this time. Hey, I, I want to give you a quick reminder, and then we're going to pray over offering today. Uh, don't forget, next week, we'll be back here. And we want to encourage you to jump online one more time. Uh, we don't know what is going to happen after that, but we know next week we're going to be at Church Online again, 930 and 1115 at wearechapel.org. We're looking forward to seeing you next week. Hey, invite some people to jump on with us. There may be people in your community, some of your neighbors that they may never go to a physical location, but they'll jump online next Sunday. So invite them to come out next week and join us at Church Online. Also, don't forget every evening monday through saturday on our facebook page we're going live at 6 p.m it's just a another touch point as we have a time of worship and have a time of prayer and a great devotion to by one of our staff members we'd love to see you there again monday through saturday 6 p.m facebook live and we want to pray over the offering today there's a giving tab right there at Church Online. If you'll click on that, you can give right there. You can also give by going online, wearechapel.org, clicking on the, the Give tab, and you can give online that way. You can also text to give, and the way you do that is you can text the amount you want to give to this number, 84321. Again, text the amount you want to give to 84321. Hey, let's pray together and just ask God to bless this offering today, and then we're going to finish out. Pastor Jason and the team is going to finish out with one more song of worship. Would you pray with me this morning? Go ahead and just stand to your feet as we pray today. Father, thank you for this word today and this service today. Thank you, Father, that you have been with us. Thank you that we can make every home an altar. God, and I pray we do that in this season. And God, I pray for the offering today as we give together as a church. God, I pray that, that you would bless it. I pray that you would give it. God, I know that for many, these are, uh, these are uncertain financial times, but God, you commanded us to continue to put you first. God, and we pray that we would give, God, out of the joy of serving you and loving you and putting you first today. So bless the offering, we pray. God, we love you. Thank you for chapel. Thank you for, your, for, your, for how you're continuing to move the mission of chapel forward. Bless us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Father, we love you this morning. Father, we are so thankful for this time in your presence. Lord, we are thankful that your presence goes before us. It's behind us, it's beside us, it's all around us, it's within us. Lord, we thank you for that promise, Lord. We thank you that we have access to you. We thank you that the veil has been torn. We can access you in your presence wherever we are. Lord, so just be with us through the rest of this day, through the rest of this week. Be with your people, Lord. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Chapel family, thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. I just would encourage you just to take some time with your family. Uh, just, just pray and talk about uh, what the Lord spoke to you this morning, what the Lord's doing uh, in your life right now. Um, we can't wait to see you guys again. Uh, but in the meantime, don't forget to join us tomorrow uh, at 6 p.m. for prayer. Uh, we love you. Uh, and bless you guys. Uh, see you next time.